Hello and welcome to Good Evening Britain, a Force for Goods weekly show coming to you live from our studios here in the heart of the great British city of Glasgow. With me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. We're broadcasting across all our digital platforms throughout the United Kingdom and across the world, bringing you quality pro-UK comment and analysis every Wednesday from 7 until 8 p.m. on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, and on TikTok. Folks, please send in your comments and send in your questions, and please tell us where you are viewing from. And tonight, we're calling this program SNP crashes down into financial chaos because goodness me with every passing day we realize the extent to which the Scottish National Party has been primarily ripping off its own members and also at the same time ripping off of course our fantastic country and the chickens are coming home to roost you know Yesterday, we learned that their auditors had jumped ship back in September. And today, we learn that the same auditors also jumped ship from the Westminster group of SNP MPs that they were also the accountants for. Because the SNP have a Westminster group and they get a lot of money from the British taxpayer. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions a year, at least one million a year anyway, according to reports today. And that comes directly from the British taxpayer that they seem to hate so much. And we pay them in order to be in Westminster and to talk their nonsense. And of course, all that money that we pay them has to be audited. But it's not being audited anymore. And so the question is, who on earth, what kind of reputable accountancy firm is going to take that job? What kind of auditor wants to get that particular gig? It would be the kiss of death for them. And so the question is, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? We'll be discussing that We'll also be discussing that with our guest tonight at the bottom of the hour at 7.30. We have the YouTube personality, Ash, that Preston journalist. And Ash will be joining us at 7.30. There is the great man himself, the brilliant Ash, that Preston journalist, not to be missed. He's coming up for 25 minutes at 7.30. 30 folks so please do stick around for that and if you're on TikTok you won't see the interview because we conduct the interview via via the computer screen here so you won't be able to see it on TikTok you'll need to go to youtube.com forward slash UK a force for good but please on TikTok send in your comments and send in any questions that you have and if you're an SNP supporter on TikTok or indeed watching on any platform tell us what you think of your party, please, and we'll read out your comments. Because goodness me, goodness me, it does look like they are not really going to recover for a while, for a while anyway. And you know, I was reading this, art. this is a, a an editorial from The Guardian newspaper. This marks a high stakes moment for Hamza Yusuf, the SNP and UK politics. And in it, it says the arrest of Mr. Morrow for 12 hours, the arrival of the police outside the home he shares with Ms. Sturgeon in Glasgow this week, and the police search of the SNP headquarters in Edinburgh all add up to something important and new. The most high-profile engagement ever seen between the criminal justice system and a modern British political party. I'm going to read that again. The most high-profile engagement ever seen between the criminal justice system and a modern British political party. To understand what is at stake, 
People should try to imagine the tensions and responses if the house and offices of a recently retired British Prime Minister had been searched in the same manner. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Uh, but this is what we've got here in Scotland. And as we said last week, isn't it so ironic and isn't it so fitting and isn't it poetic justice that the money that they raised to try to destroy our great United Kingdom is the money that's bringing them down. Three cheers for that. Fantastic. All these people given money for such a dismal negative cause only to discover that the money that they wasted is the money that paid to bring their own party down. Hallelujah, as they say. Emma wonders if it was a decoy to take our eyes away from something else. Has there been any charges yet? No, there hasn't been any charges yet, Rio. And we'll wait to see what comes of that. But here we go. Accountants cut and run after SNP's deepening crisis becomes festering wound. This was a few days ago. The big picture is there's so many questions that require an answer and they're not going to go away. They're going to suppurate like a festering wound. Until they are answered, the new First Minister will be the victim of collateral damage, says a senior supporter of Kate Forbes. It's necessary for Sturgeon and Murrell to give questions, to, to give answers to all these questions. What on earth is going on? Now, here's the thing. The party has until July the 7th to present their next set of accounts to the Electoral Commission or face possible sanctions. Now, the Electoral Commission is the the um, arm's length quango that that's responsible for ensuring that political parties and elections and referendums in this country are run by a set of laws. And they're also responsible for registering all the political parties that exist and that are allowed to exist in the country and also ensuring that all of these political parties put forward accounts and explain where their money comes from and where it goes. And these are legal requirements that everybody, even if you stand as an independent, you have to report to the Electoral Commission in one way or another. And the law which which uh, runs and the law by which the Electoral Commission run affairs is called the Political Parties Elections and Referendums Act 2000. And it details penalties that uh, are in order if you um, don't follow the regulations properly. And let's bring up the Section 43 of the Political Parties Elections and Referendums Act 2000. There you go. And the blue bit there of Section 43 says, if it appears to the Commission that any accounts required to be audited by virtue of these subsections have not been duly audited by the time mentioned, in this case 7th of July, the Commission may appoint a qualified auditor to audit those accounts. Okay, so what that means is if those accounts are not with the Electoral Commission by the 7th of July, the Commission may appoint its own auditor or its own team who will go in and try to find out what's going on. And let's look at the next section here that I want to bring up. Section 44, that an auditor who is so duly appointed to carry out an audit is entitled to require from the treasurer or any other officer of the party any such information and explanations as he thinks necessary for the performance of that task. Okay, basically, your auditor can require the SNP to to give them whatever they 
want as far as information is concerned. And if that's not forthcoming, let's look at the next section. Criminal penalty for failure to submit proper statement of accounts. If in the case of a registered party, these requirements or regulations are not properly um, uh, delivered to the commission, then the person who was the treasurer of the party immediately before the end of that period is guilty of an offence. Okay, so that's not talked about so much, but the actual party treasurer or any officials they're associated with could be guilty of an offence, a criminal offence, it might be added. Another section that I wanted to bring up was um, pointing out the the actual penalties and they're mainly the penalties are mainly fines okay various kinds of fines but there's a lot of offenses a lot of offenses in that particular act uh, which can be found in the schedules under penalties and reading through them it could be said that the Scottish National Party are guilty of a lot of them and um, a very serious situation that the party has got itself into and goodness me if if it is um, if it's not able to sort this out what could happen to it what could happen to it um, one thing that the the uh, they can do what one thing the SNP can do is they can they can ask for more time if July 7th rolls around and they don't have anything ready, they can ask for more time and it's up to the Electoral Commission whether or not, in view of the circumstances, they're prepared to give the SNP more time to sort it out. So the SNP will keep this running for as long as they can. Uh, 7th of July isn't the, the final uh, say-so if the Electoral Commission allows the SNP more time um, which they may do just for political and diplomatic reasons. Who knows? Who knows? As we say, it's all to be played for. All to be played for at this stage. Lots of comments coming in. Um, great stuff. Thanks for that. AR Entertainment wonders if Nicola Sturgeon will stand down as the MSP for Glasgow Southside. Would her seat be lost to a unionist party like Labour? That's uh, a good question. I would need to look at the the um, what the what the actual uh, how much she's in the lead by. Um, we need to find that out. But it's a possibility, isn't it? Anything's up for grabs. Whether she would stand down or not, I don't know. She certainly won't be standing at the next uh, Scottish election. That's for sure. But whether she stands down in the interim. We'll have to see. That may be something that she'll only do if she's pushed into a situation where that is the appropriate diplomatic response. Good evening, as always, to Debbie and to Susan and to TC and to Paul from the Garden of Kent, from the Garden of England, known as Kent. Adam says hello. And Kat, Kat, will be mentioning you on this day in British history, because I know you visited the great British city of Lincoln, and we'll be talking about that later in the show. Harry says, Evening Unionists and AFFG. Wasn't on last week due to it being my birthday. Well, happy birthday to Harry Brown. Happy birthday, Harry. British Legends says, A force for good, always for good, no surrender. Adam believes, quite rightly, the SNP is imploding. The return of a Labour-led Scotland could be inevitable. Well, whether that's something to cheer for or not is very much in question, depending upon your political point of view. I know some people will think that's a great thing. Um, what the Labour Party will have to do is to distinguish themselves as somehow different from the SNP on lots of other matters, rather than simply copying them on all the usual matters, which it's been doing lately. Around, for example, the trans thing. There's no, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, put uh, a piece of paper between the difference between of the SNP and Labour. They both think exactly the same on those sorts of matters. 
Hello to Tommy. And Freaky has a message to the SNP, which is bye bye, you won't be missed. And watch the door doesn't hit you on the way out, as we like to say. British legends wonders if Sturgeon's going to prison. Well, time will tell on those on those things. Someone says, Nicholas Sturgeon in jail would remind me of Lizzie Birdsworth in Prisoner Cell Block H. Not a programme that I ever watched, so I can't... But I can imagine what you mean. I can imagine what you mean. And Mark says, it's a great time to be a unionist. Every day is a good day if you're a unionist. Absolutely. And Michael Wright says, great that you are exposing these charlatans. And Adam believes it's time for the SNP to go back to the opposition benches in Holyrood. That's right, they took, they took away a camper van from outside of old Mrs. Morrow's house. And as somebody quipped on Twitter... It was like we had moved from Brookside to Breaking Bad. We had moved from the um, suburban drama to somebody using a camper van to, to cook meth. For those of you who have seen that American series, Brookside to Breaking Bad, it's all happening in the Scottish National Party. And as Christopher says, it really is incredible to imagine a business without any financial oversight. Truly unbelievable and corrupt. Utterly unbelievable and corrupt. And these are the people who are running Scotland and got voted for as well. So goodness me. Goodness me. And Christopher says that we need the UK government to carry out a full audit of the Scottish uh, administration and... Yes, we we certainly do, and that that should be something that's done on a regular basis, just just to ensure proper governance of Scotland. There should be a, a national audit that's that's taken just to make sure that the devolved assemblies and parliaments are being run appropriately. That's an important thing that that we should be campaigning on and, and mentioning regularly. Cable says, do you still believe the union is 5,000 years old? We're changing that now. We think it's maybe 10,000 years old. Mr. White says, let's be honest with ourselves. This party has been corrupt for years and nothing has ever been said. Even our own British government has let this rumble on. There ain't no charges coming their way. Well, I know what you mean. Sometimes you wonder if the British government will ever get off its... Uh, backside to do very much at all well time will tell time will tell Paul says thank you for the special edition of Union Heart which arrived today crikey we sent it last week but good to see that it's arrived Paul that's Union Heart Union of Crowns and this is available free of charge to any monthly donor who simply requests to be put on our magazine mailing list and it's also available at our shop, aforceforgood.uk hyphen, no, aforceforgood.uk forward slash shop hyphen one. And it's, it's, it's selling very well. There you go. And this is celebrating the 420th anniversary this year of the Union of the Crowns. As it was on this day, 12th of April in 1606, when the first ever Union Jack was commanded to wave. And we wrote about this in our magazine. A Scotsman created the Union Jack. That's in our latest issue of Union Heart. James VI created the Union Jack to represent the union of the kingdoms of Scotland and England. 
Wales at the time was considered a principality of the Kingdom of England. And that was on the 12th of April today in 1606. And of course the St. Patrick's Cross was added at the Union with Ireland in 1801. But it was on this day that he issued a royal proclamation ordering all royal and merchant ships to fly it. That from hence force, hence forth all our subjects of this isle and kingdom of Great Britain and the members thereof shall bear in their main top. This flag joined together according to a form made by our heralds and sent by us to our admirable admiral to be published to our said subjects. That's on this day. And people will say, oh, it's the Union flag, it's not the Union Jack. Well, while we were researching this, and we mentioned this fact here, we discovered that the British Parliamentary website actually states this incredible piece of information. Check it out. The Union Jack flag. In 1606, James VI gave orders for a British flag to be created which bore the combined crosses of St. George and of St. Andrew. The result was the Union Jack. Jack being a shortening of Jacobus, the Latin version of James. And that's in the British Parliament website. So you heard it from them. The result was the Union Jack. Jack being a shortening of Jacobus, the Latin version of James. Not many people know that. And you always get people say, oh, it's meant to be like the Jack staff of a Jack or whatever. But so that was on this day, the Union Jack invented. And I also want to thank Kat, who's one of our viewers, for bringing another thing to our attention on this day. And on this day, five years ago, was the official opening of the, get this, the International Bomber Command Center in Lincoln, which is a museum that we had never heard of before. But it's um, today is the fifth year anniversary of its existence. And it's, situ it's situated in Lincoln at uh, Canwick Avenue. And world-class facility acknowledging the efforts, sacrifices and commitment of those from 62 different nations who came together in Bomber Command during World War II, hence the international appellation attached to it. And at the heart of the centre is the Memorial Spire, which we'll just put up there. There it is. That is to represent the city's the spire on the city's cathedral, which apparently served as a sighting point for crews who are flying out from Lincolnshire. And they've also got a wall of names. And um, apparently there's 271 individual panels scattered there, or not scattered, but... Um, created around the spire and centre and the names list the 58,000 people who lost their lives serving or supporting Bomber Command during World War II with the names in alphabetical order and there's also a Falkland Islands tribute um, standing with Giants, it's called, and there you can see it through some of the walls of names. And these are silhouettes, 258 silhouetted life-size figures of British military personnel and three Falkland Islanders who lost their lives during the conflict with Argentina back in 1982. And let's see, there's, a, there's another one in Cat tells us, she says, I found walking amongst the Standing with Giants installation very emotive, especially as the silhouettes were swaying in the breeze. And families come from all over the world to the IBCC to view the names of their loved ones memorialized on the walls. Tommy says, the UK government has just given them enough rope. 
it seems so they're doing a very good job of climbing up the gallows themselves, the SNP. Now, ladies and gentlemen, YouTube personality Ash, that Preston journalist, is going to be with us for the next 25 minutes. Please say hello to Ash. Evening. Hello, Ash. Are you well? I'm very well, thank you very much. You must be enjoying the uh, carry-on that's, uh, that's playing here in Scotland. Oh, it's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, even when uh, Sturgeon resigned, I thought it was terrific, but then it just seems to be getting worse every day. <laughs> a, new, a new scandal every day just seems to be emerging, doesn't it? It's it's so yes. fantastic. It's so fantastic to see. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's given you no shortage of uh, material for your regular uh, YouTube broadcasts because, Ash, uh, you do a programme... Well, you don't do a programme... Um, but you do uh, regular videos every day. You're knocking out videos. How many are you putting out on average a day? Put four out a day usually, unless something big happens. Then I might do a quick one just to uh, get something out there. But yeah, usually usually four a day. That's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic work. And I noticed you had one up today, which was about people in Scotland actually wanting to shut Hollywood down. What was that one about? Yeah, that was one I saw. In fact, like, you know, if I said it's just the Express, then SNP voters would go, oh, that's rubbish then. But it was also the Herald and the Courier also receiving letters from people, not just who are unionists, but people who were SNP voters that wanted Holyrood closed down. Some of them were saying that the independence cause is finished anyway now because they believed that Salmon and Sturgeon were the only ones that could do anything to deliver it. And obviously they both failed. Some, of course, were unionists as well, saying that Holyrood wasn't worth the money that it costs anymore. It's a very expensive institution. And really, it's all it's done is let people down. It, it's, it isn't there to serve the people anymore, is it? It isn't there to look after people who are struggling with energy bills, etc. It's simply there to promote the breaking up of the UK, which is not what a devolved administration should be doing. That's right. That's right. All, all it's done is it's simply given a platform to uh, an aggressively anti-UK party in order to grandstand and to promote its anti-unity, anti-solidarity, anti-British, often anti-English message, um, given them a great platform to do that, um, but not anything that's actually uh, improved our particular lives for the better. And so it's it's very easy to, to, to believe that things could just be, they'd either be the same or they'd be better if, in fact, we had, uh, if we didn't have it at all. Now, of course, the question is we've got it and it's not going away. And the only way that we could get it to go away would be if uh, we had a referendum, really. To get it to go away, I know some people might fantasize about, oh, somebody can just uh, press a button and shut it down, but uh, I don't see how politically feasible that would be, really. Um, not at this stage, anyway. Um, what would you would you agree with that, or do you think that uh, the British government should take a much more sort of proactive approach on that? I I think for the, for the for Westminster to intervene in any way in Holyrood, and whether it stays open or not, would simply play into the hands of Alex Salmond in the Alba Party and Humza Yusuf in the SNP. They would have the biggest weapon ever to turn round to everyone who may have supported independence in the past or still does to say, oh, look what they're doing to us. They now want to take our parliament away as well as blocking laws that we want to pass as well. So I don't think it would be a wise move for Westminster to get involved. Well, the costs yeah. of running Holyrood are absolutely massive now. They, they cost more. I believe I read this somewhere. They cost It costs more now for the MSPs, the quangos, this, all, that, all the salaries, the expenses, than it does to actually run the building. Really? So it yeah. really is a very expensive institution. But no, I, I don't think it'd be right, yeah. But I don't think it'd be right for Westminster to intervene at this point because it... Like I said, it would just, I believe it would actually promote independence rather than uh, helping the unionist cause. But maybe people might think differently, but that, that's my thoughts. 
Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean, and I can understand that happening because you look at the fuss that they're able to generate if the British Parliament does something innocuous, such as knock back a particular law that uh, mm. is inappropriate for a United Kingdom, such as what they did with the GRR. And you look at the fuss mm -hmm. that uh, Hamza Yusuf makes about that. Although somebody made a very good point to me today. They said, you know, when Hamza Yusuf's talking about taking the... Because what, cause what he's going to do is uh, it looks like he's going to go to the court uh, and contest the the British Parliament for knocking back the GRR bill and for not allowing it to go ahead. Well, he's on to a loser there anyway. Yeah. But the argument that he's making is not anything substantial about the actual content of the GRR bill. He's not saying that this is what has to be done because it's fair to these particular people or something like that. What he's... The whole angle is Scotland's democracy denied. Okay, that's that's the line yeah. that he knows. The same old tired and tested lines, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He thinks that's the angle that will appeal to people rather than trying to say, yeah, uh, children should be able to self-identify as whatever they want, you know. Instead of that angle, which he knows won't really get much support, he's going with the Scotland's democracy's been denied again yeah. sort of thing. And it's it, it's the same old Sturgeon lines, isn't it? It's just, it didn't work for her. So what makes him think that he's any better of a communicator than she was? Because he's not. And if she couldn't get it passed, and it brought her down in the end, as we both know, then what chance has he got? He's only doing this for the grievance manifesto, isn't it? It's just, but it's just he hasn't got anything original to say. He's made some mistakes in his political career. I mean, every job he's ever touched has turned into an absolute disaster. But I think taking this job as First Minister is his biggest mistake to date. Mm -hmm. he's, mm -hmm. he's walked into, he might have thought it'd be a difficult job to regain some support possibly because they were already dropping in the polls. But now all these scandals are coming out left, right and centre, some of which I can't prove and I'm not sure. I suspect he knows more about some of them than, uh, than what he's letting on. But obviously he's telling us that he didn't know anything about all this stuff at the moment. But he has made a huge mistake here. Do you, do you, how do you see him, his future? Uh, how long do you think he's going to be in place given the present circumstances? I think he'll be lucky to see the next general election. Really? I'd, I'd, yeah. I'd, I think if he goes to the Supreme Court now with his gender bill, which he's saying he will do, fine. He's going to spend hundreds of thousands on t of taxpayers' money again on a wasted court case. He's going to send that Dorothy Bain down there, who, let's face it, she was absolutely hopeless when Sturgeon tried to get her to argue for a referendum. So much so that the SNP themselves had to write individual letters to the Supreme Court because they thought she was crap. So how she going how how she's going to get um, the gender bill through? I don't know. And once he's lost that, that's his grievance done. What's he, what's he, what's he got left? Absolutely nothing. That's 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 right. Well, what he might then do is, by that time, perhaps we'll be having a general election and he'll be able to say, look at us, we went to the Supreme Court and we got turned down again. It was so terrible, um, this terrible English court. They love <laughs> Yeah, English that's court. it, yeah, yeah. Even though the, the guy in charge of it's a Scottish judge. And even though... Yeah, that's right, um, yeah. Um, the, even though... When uh, Sturgeon got turned down back last November, the the panel of five judges were from each part of the UK. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that would be a, like another failure to add to um, to his long list of failures. Um, my my own opinion is that the only reason that he'll last in that job is because nobody of any sense is going to want to take it on. Yeah, it's the ultimate poison chalice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So even if he does continue to fail in it, even somebody, everybody's talking up Kate Forbes. I mean, I don't know. I think because she can string a few sentences together. <laughs> but, I mean, basically that makes her special in the SNP. There's nothing like intrinsically <laughs> remarkable about this woman. I've never read an article. Well, 
I know she writes articles or somebody writes articles for her in the national, but she, yeah. in fact, I read there was one yesterday, but I couldn't be bothered reading it because it's like, who cares, basically. Anyway, she uh, there's nothing special about her or indeed any of these SNP people, and none of them uh, will want to take on this poison chalice at this particular stage, not for a long while. So I I no. see him I see him being in there just kind of as a default figure, really. Uh, as a as a kind of is the what's the phrase is it a whipping boy or somebody yeah. you, you scapegoat isn't he scapegoat that's the phrase scapegoat yeah he's just a scapegoat like, yeah 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 stick him in there and and who cares kind of thing uh, that's how I see him I have to say and but it probably yeah. is and then when he loses the next election and loses a load of seats that then they'll probably try and replace him I don't know if you've noticed or not but Kate Forbes has changed her lines a little bit today. She's been very critical of um, Humza Yusuf, not surprisingly, since he came in. But today, she's calling for party unity. She's calling for them all to get behind him and march towards independence and all that usual rubbish, which says to me that she's quite happy to um, sit it out on the sidelines and watch him fail. Because if I was her, I'd be so relieved that I didn't win the election, that win the leadership contest that I'd be happy to just sit there and watch the person who kicked me out of the cabinet fail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They always do that, the SNP. They always go, oh, we need unity and uh, we need we need to come together. And it's like, yeah, we all need to, we need unity and we need to come together so that we can succeed in dividing the Scottish people against themselves. You mm. know, it's, uh, well, it's a really ironic message that they've got, you know, uh, only by uniting together can we successfully divide the people. Is basically the angle. Yeah, that, yeah, that, of course. That, that that they take, you know, um, it's 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 absurd. Yeah, that's and one I, thing I'll say for Sturgeon. You know, sorry to interrupt you. No. That's one thing I'll say for Sturgeon. Despite the fact I don't like her, she managed to keep a lot of divisions very very secret, didn't she? Nobody really knew what was going on inside the party, even when people didn't see eye to eye on different things it could, it turns out recently that people like Kate Forbes by the way weren't even allowed in cabinet meetings so they didn't even know what policies were being announced so that's how she did it she just didn't tell anybody what was going on and she just made them all fall in line and she did it very effectively whereas now she's gone it's like a weight's been lifted off all these people's shoulders and they're happy to speak out all over the place now about what's going wrong in the party but the problem is They've all got different views on everything. None of them seem to agree on anything. You've got your outcasts like Joanna Cherry, who will never be welcome in the party, and if they could get rid of them, they probably would. And then the other side, you've got your ultra-independence people that don't seem to agree with Humza Yusuf or Joanna Cherry. And then there's people like Stephen Flynn. If you can tell me what he believes in, then good luck to you, because he is the most inept politician I've seen speak in Westminster. Absolutely terrible. If you watch him stand there, he's got his arms by his side. He's he's like some little boy being told off by the headmaster in his in the office. Yeah, he looks absolutely yeah. terrible. Yeah. Well, I can tell you what he does believe in, and if I was him, I would believe in it too. And that's my eighty-four thousand one hundred and forty-four pounds salary. Yeah. Which is very nice money if you can get it, and that's like. That's a year, eighty-four thousand pounds a year mm. for plus five expenses, years. <laughs> plus huge expenses. Yeah, huge expenses. Um, you never need to worry about anything again. Quite frankly, if you can become a MP for five years, put some money aside, you could probably retire for the next twenty years if you play your cards right. So that's what they do believe in. Um, ultimately, I think. Uh, so yeah, great work if you can if you can get it. And some people are just born in the right place at the right time, and they find themselves an MP down in Westminster. Um, it's incredible. It's absolutely um, incredible. Well, you made a great point before when you said that obviously the the auditors have now quit the Westminster branch of the party as well, and those people are going to be audited even closer, I suspect, than the SNP in Holyrood. Because they're all being paid more than the SNP. Sorry, they're all being paid more than the Holyrood SNP. They're all being paid more in expenses than the MSP counterparts. The salary is, what, 20 thousand pounds more for an MP than it is for an MSP. 
The travel costs yeah. are absolutely humongous. If you look at someone like Murray Black, uh, Ian Blackford, I know they live further away than, say, an English politician, but their expenses, you're talking huge sums of money, quarter of a million pounds, £300,000 expenses. Mm. Absolutely mm. huge amounts of money. A huge amounts of money, and uh, all from us, from the British taxpayer as well, which is the most remarkable thing. We pay yeah. them to to try to break up the country. <laughs> yeah, it's remarkable, which, isn't it? Which kind of boils my proverbial, I have to say. Um, especially, uh, I mean, you and I were grassroots activists and uh, we're trying to save the country. And, like, the British government don't care about us, but they'll give the SNP and allow the SNP to have, like, hundreds of thousands of pounds. Each individual member of the SNP to have hundreds of thousands of pounds a year to, to destroy the country. Yeah. Just the way it works, I suppose that's, that's democracy for you. Well, for yeah, you. I suppose yeah. so. It's so, sort of what we said last time, isn't it? It's Had Westminster... Can you put the group? Had Westminster actually um, done their job from day one with Salmond, with Sturgeon and all the rest of them, this would never have happened because they'd have been... They'd have had the wings clipped many times and they'd have known what they can do, what they can't do, what's devolved, what's not, instead of appeasing them left, right and centre. And now they get kind of understandably really offended when Westminster actually do their jobs because they're not used to it. But make no mistake, when Humza goes to the Supreme Court, if he does, Alistair Jack will have a watertight case against him. The UK government will have a watertight case against him because otherwise they would never have taken the step in the first place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that's that's a good point. That's a good point. The extent to which um, the SNP, because the SNP have to be trained as like this is how devolution works. You know, mm. it's quite right that certainly, for example, within within the United Kingdom, we do respect the voice of the Scottish Parliament, but we respect it within the overall voice of the British Parliament. Yeah. And that's that's a reflection of we're respecting the voice of the Scottish people within the overall context of the voice of the British people as expressed through our collective parliament. That's the way it works. So sometimes the voice of Holyrood might have to get uh, over overridden by mm. the the louder voice of all the people of the United Kingdom. There's nothing sinister about that. That's the way that devolution works. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're not in a we're not in a in a separated Scotland at this time. If we were in a separated Scotland and somehow the British Parliament was laying down the law, then you could complain because that wouldn't be right. But so long as you're part of a devolved structure where the British Parliament is ultimately the the final say because it represents all the people of the United Kingdom, then you can't complain about that unless you're deliberately trying to misrepresent the nature of devolution, which, of course, is what they're trying to do. So yeah. they have to be trained to understand it properly. And from the very get-go, that's not really been properly done, even when Labour were in charge. I mean, Labour had an easy run because... There was a Labour administration at Holyrood while they had a Labour government at Westminster. So yeah. there was really no tension there. There was really no political tension there. And Labour... And so there was never any need for the Labour Party at the time to explain what devolution was and how it was meant to work. And then when the Tories came in under under uh, Cameron and so on, well, they didn't have a clue about anything. I mean, Cameron <laughs> didn't even... He didn't even know what the Magna Carta was, let alone what oh, devolution in a British constitution is. I mean, he was literally, when you look back, you have to understand the extent to which that these these folk at the time were utterly clueless, utterly clueless. And we think, oh, politician, you know, uh, in Westminster, he's on the telly, he must be clever. No, they're not. No, he wasn't. These people are educated at some of the finest schools in the world. You, you wouldn't think it, would you? People like yeah. David Cameron, if, uh, him and George Osborne were an absolute disaster for this country. I mean, so was Blair, don't get me wrong. We had a series of terrible governments. Yes. But, in fact, it's continued ever since, I think. We've, <laughs> we've had really bad governments ever since. But, yeah, Cameron was absolutely awful. Mm. And then when he mm. came out and made 
you know, just when I thought the S&P Ronda declined a few years ago, was it David Cameron that came out and said, oh, the Queen was purring in Buckingham yeah. Palace because the Scots have voted to stay in the UK. Like, why would you say something so so, mm. so stupid? Yes, just, he, he should have kept his, his mouth shut on that particular on that particular issue. I did read this article today um, by Hamza Youssef in The National, which I read so that other people don't have to. And he's saying that we are predicting his and the SNP's demise. And uh, But, oh, guess what? They're not going to demise. Um, and he says something which always puzzles me. And lots of SNP people say it. And I'll just read it out. He's talking about Scotland. And he's going, quite rightly, he's saying, Scotland has brilliant entrepreneurs in a tech sector which attracts international attention. We have some of the most significant energy resources on the continent. We have world-class universities and colleges. And on some measures, we have the most highly educated workforce in Europe. To which I would add, yeah, thanks to the union. Thanks mm. to being part of the United Kingdom. Okay, he's, but it doesn't. These are all the, all the positives that they always talk about that we enjoy here in Scotland. It is thanks to the union. Yeah, That's why it's devolution it. settlements, Barnet consequentials. How yeah. would Scotland, and no, no offence to Scotland, it's, I mean, it's a relatively small country, say, compare it to England. How would it ever, or the rest of the UK, for example, how would it ever pay for free hospital parking, free tuition fees, free prescriptions? If it left the UK, there'd be no... Um, devolution settlements or anything like that so like you said rightly everything they name just supports the union it's like they don't mm. seem to understand this mm. yeah yeah well apparently what they would do according to the green party and some of the wilder shores of the scottish national party and probably the labor party as well is they're going to tax all the rich people well i've lived in scotland all my life and i've never I, well i think i've met one person that i would classify as rich you know mm. they're not exactly uh, ten a penny here in Scotland, and you got to remember, Scotland's a small. It's a small population, but yeah. it's, well, it's growing every day. Uh, if my bus journey into town is any thing to <laughs> go by, but uh, it's um, uh, leaving that controversy aside. Uh, normally, without that particular element of growth, it, you're looking at just uh, slightly over five million people. Yeah, and it's been like that for a long time, and. Um, most of the population is around the central belt and uh, it does not have a high proportion of very rich people that can be taxed. And remember, if you are a very rich person, you've got lots of options and you don't have to hang around on one no. side. You take that of, money out, uh, don't you? Yeah, you take it out or you, or you move your um, your business. Or you, sometimes you just have to move your business address. Mm. You don't even have to move yourself. Yeah. You know? So um, it's uh, it's... Ignorant to imagine that we're going to get all this new money by taxing people in Scotland. Um, it doesn't work. And no. even even Westminster are doing something similar, like stealth taxing and things like that. But if you look at, there's a good article about Norway going around at the moment, if you look, and a lot of the wealthy in Norway are now moving to other countries around the continent, or even to London, for example, to set up businesses, because they've raised all the taxes on the wealth, on the on the wealthy, sorry. There's rumours now that Humza Yusuf wants to bring in another um, level of tax in Scotland, up to 45 pence at the top rate of tax. And it's already higher than uh, your brothers and sisters down in England, for example. So how much more high do you think they're going to raise it? And if you can't take an example from a country like Norway, which for a, you know, a moderately sized country is very successful business-wise and economically... If they're losing now huge amounts of wealth because of increasing taxes, then take that lesson. Don't copy a system that's blatantly broken. So whatever wealth they have, like McVitie's, you remember all that that scandal? They all just move, they just, they'll just move. They'll take their businesses elsewhere, whether it's across the border to Carlisle or something, and they'll pay less tax. Why wouldn't you if you ran a business or if you had millions of pounds in the banks? You're not going to stay somewhere voluntarily that's going to tax you like, even more than anywhere else, are you? No, no, no. It's 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 uh, it's a losing game. I played a losing game, and that's what they're certainly doing. It's um, I can't believe that's almost top of the hour actually. So we'll have to call our we chat to an end. Ash, thank you very much for coming on. Can um, I just say one more thing quickly? Go ahead. Yeah. There's a there's a, 
there's a comment just appeared, and if your producer can put it up, it is a blatant lie from someone called IndyRef. Totally, absolutely untrue. <laughs> Scotland does not send more money down to the rest of the UK than it gets back from Westminster. Just look at the facts, look at the figures, and look at it's just because the money goes missing under the SNP that you think Scotland sends more than it gets back, but it's blatantly not true. I just wanted to get that in there. I'm glad you got that in there, <laughs> and I'm glad you got that off your chest. And from a unionist perspective, even if that were the case, uh, unionist people would say, well, hooray, because that's what it, the union is about. The union is about sharing our resources. And uh, many times it may be that England sends more to Scotland. Sometimes Scotland might be sending more to England, but so what? Because at the end of the day, we're all British and the point of yeah. the union is to share our resources. So exactly. um, even if that were the case, we unionists would say hooray to that. And, and oh yeah, I wasn't saying continue. Scotland doesn't contribute. Of course it does. I'm not saying well, that exactly. at all. Exactly. It's I just know exactly blatant lies it. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, misrepresentation. Thanks for clearing that up, Ash. Now, <laughs> if people want to watch your videos, and I do suggest that people uh, subscribe to Ash's YouTube channel. It's youtube.com forward slash that Preston journalist, and follow Ash also on twitter.com forward slash AK writing eighty eight. That's yeah. fantastic. Ash, more power to your elbow. Uh, well done with your YouTube channel. I know it's gone from strength to strength. And you've got viewers. You put out a video um, and an hour later it's got 3,000 views. That's what we uh, what we call good going. So thanks, Ash. Mm. We'll get you back on as yep. soon as we can. And um, we'll be in touch. Yep. Thank you, Alistair. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Thank you. Good See you night. later. Bye now. Fantastic. Ash, that Preston journalist, a great and always favourite commentator on our show. And thanks for everybody who are sending in the comments to Ash there. Um, that's very much appreciated. Thank you, Ash. Now, what else have we got to mention? Today is the day in 1606 when the Union Jack was effectively born. And if you want this flag, we do sell it at our shop. Let's put up the link to it. Shop hyphen one at our website and it's the top of the hour. Now, folks, every second Friday, we send out an email update. And um, you can sign up to that at aforceforgood.uk forward slash sign hyphen one. And that's something that... is worth signing up to keeps you in touch with what we're doing because we do have quite a bit of summer activism lined up and we'll keep you in the picture with that at a force for good dot uk forward slash sign hyphen up sign up to that and also give us a follow on youtube please because that's always helping us also now we'll be back with a guest next week it's David Scott and next week is going to be a special program because we're going to last for an hour and a half because last time that David was on he had a lot to say and I know he's going to have even more to say this time so we're going to do a 45 minute interview with David Scott of UK Column that'll be next week so a program next week will run from 7 until 8 30. And that's thanks to our assistant producer for arranging that particular one. That will be next Wednesday, the 19th, an hour and a half program with a great extended interview 
with David Scott and we're going to talk about what is the SNP among other things also but until then folks thank you for watching across all our channels and thank you also on TikTok and we will be back next week so it just remains for me to say God bless the United Kingdom and God save the King see you next week <laughs>